I'll be talking about C Sharp today, and uh, I think to begin, I have a few words about myself. The most important detail on there is my email address. If you guys want to shoot me some feedback after the talk, tell me how badly I sucked or that kind of thing, right? <laughs> Please do. I don't get enough email, so I'm constantly trying to get more. That's <laughs> It's one of, one of my, you know, Chad said, you have to execute, right? So here I am. Right? <laughs> All right, so uh, that's me. And uh, today I'll be talking about C Sharp. And uh, this is going to be a pretty funny talk, I think, because I've got a uh, bunch of things collected that people do in C Sharp that are kind of not so cool, right? That are creepy. Like, uh, you know, I, I kind of focused on that term here because in the end you look at uh, code and it makes you cringe. You know what cringe is? Like when you go, you know, I wish he hadn't done that or I wish I hadn't done that, right? Because we're, <laughs> we're all doing it all the time, aren't we? So that's the creepy thing. And I've got a few major blocks of content here. Uh, uh, matters of truth is like my first block, you know, why people don't believe that the truth is actually the truth, it'll be, <laughs> you'll, you'll understand in a moment, not invented here, in other words, reinventing the wheel wherever you go, right? That's another thing that uh, people do a lot. Patterns, um, and then also commenting, which is, of course, something that we all love, right? Do you write lots of comments yourself in code? Like, look at this line. I particularly like this piece of code, that kind of stuff. Nobody comments here, huh? Or nobody says anything. That's all right. <laughs> we'll see comments. Anyway, so that's like the major blocks. Uh, I have to say we have 45 minutes, so it's going to be a pretty short time, really. I don't know if we're going to be able to look at every single example I have here, but feel free to download the slide deck from my blog and you know check out a few more elements in there later on, perhaps, if we maybe don't get around to every single piece. Uh, right, so matters of the truth, right? That's kind of important. C Sharp, like many other programming languages, actually knows the truth pretty well, right? Um, you know, every programming language has its own understanding of the truth, of course, like, you know, when in C you could use all sorts of things as truth values, right? Any kind of expression in C can be evaluated as, as to whether or not it's true, right? That's, that's easy to do. In C Sharp, uh, there's this Boolean type, so they they think that everything that is true or false should be represented by a Boolean. The problem is people actually don't believe that C Sharp knows this, apparently, right? I mean, how else do you explain like, something simple like this here, maybe? You know, somebody uh, actively comparing this Boolean thing to false is not equal to false. I mean, maybe this is like, you know, expressing intent or something. I'm being charitable there, right? It might also be that the developer was just having another minute to waste in his day or something like that. I don't know. But that's, uh, that's the easy thing, right? So you don't have to write this. I think we know this, right? I'm not trying here to be, uh, uh, I don't know, put you down with something. You know, you, you can just do not my Boolean variable. Everybody here knows this, right? I hope. Unless maybe you're not a C-sharp programmer. In that case, you're totally forgiven for not knowing this. That's <laughs> All right, so anyway, that's, that's the boring example. We also have stuff like this, though. And I have to tell you, maybe at this point, that this is all, I mean, this is all made up from samples that I found in real li life, pretty much, right? There are some uh, samples, I have to admit, that I took for the value of fun from the internet. So I cannot attest personally to every single one, but that's like maybe 10%. The majority of those is from actual projects I encountered myself with uh, clients where I was doing consulting. And um, in some cases, I asked for their permission to include them in this talk. In some other cases, I just thought, well, it's all anonymous, so who cares, right? So I included them anyway. And uh, so this is all real, okay? This is all real. Is available equals to true. Now that is fun. However, you can also go this way, which is actually <laughs> something that I encountered a number of times in a particular piece of code, right? Just uh, wrap your head around this for a moment there, perhaps. Okay, so this is, this is something somebody actually wrote, and that's where it gets a little weird, isn't it? Where people apparently don't understand this whole concept of truth to begin with, right? Um, we also, of course, have things like that if you want to be really crazy about it. So let's, let's, you know, maybe spend a second on this, right? So if the, you know, thing is like four characters long, fair enough, it has to be true, right? <laughs> then, of course, we have the else branch where maybe the thing is five characters long, in which case I guess it's false, okay? Fair enough. So if these, both those conditions have not turned out to be true yet, 
all right? Then we do this, and what the hell is that supposed to mean, right? So anyway, yeah, that's, uh, that, that is one of the most exciting ones, I suppose, that I ever saw. But, you know, people can get more creative. I think this is from the old days when you actually, in order to confirm formatting your hard drive or something, they made you type in stuff like, yes, I really want to do this, right, as a confirmation. And then they did this. Do you get what's going on there? So we've got this, uh, this factor thing that's being passed in. And that is compared using a hash code to this other yes thing that is being passed in, which is in fact the string yes. So I, <laughs> I think they must have made the poor user type in yes or something like that, you know, and then compared it. And they found the most complicated way of comparing two strings as well. So that's uh, kudos. All right, so that's uh, the true thing. Of course, this is a classic, right? We've all seen that one, I suppose. <laughs> That, that is old, but it's really cool, isn't it? I guess somebody, th I, I mean, this person was obviously aware of Boolean logic, right? They just thought it's not good enough. So we're, just gonna, <laughs> we're just gonna add an item in there. File not found is obviously a very important state. Now, just imagine we were gonna do this for every single purpose. I mean, the idea perhaps of having an enum like this is maybe good, I don't know, right? Depending on the context. However, maybe they shouldn't have called it bool, right? <laughs> That's kind of strange. Okay, true, false, file not found. That's one of my favorite uh, Boolean um, uh, versions there, I suppose. Uh, yeah, we also have, of course, method implementations <laughs> like this. <laughs> That's kind of cool. Always returns true, is available. <laughs> Return false. That, that's, we get into commenting here. Yeah? Do you see why comments are important? I mean, how would you have known otherwise, right? That's, that's why comments are important as well. So uh, then we have, you know, this is more like a practical kind of thing. Anybody know why people write stuff like this? You've, say what? Yoda statements? You mean like the wrong way around, like Yoda talks? Okay, that's interesting. I, yeah, okay, so this is not code written by Yoda, I can tell you. <laughs> it's like, uh, anyway, yeah, I mean, people do this, right? You might have seen it yourself. People haven't seen this? No, no, okay. You've seen it? Good. Sorry? Legacy of C, yes, uh, exactly, that's what it is. C, C++ programmers like to write like this. Okay, and why do they do this? Because if you write it this way around, you cannot accidentally forget to use one of the equals operators there, which would result in, a, in an assignment statement, right? And in C, you can actually have an, an assignment statement in an if clause and get that assignment evaluated to Boolean, if you like, right? Uh, because C didn't have a Boolean, so they just made it up like that. And in C, there was always the danger, if you were writing an, an equality comparison like that, to just accidentally miss out on one of those equal signs, and then you would suddenly assign a value instead of checking for a value, resulting in all sorts of crazy misbehavior. So that's why people ended up, if they were comparing against literals, uh, just writing this the, op the opposite way around to, I guess, the way most people would uh, agree is like the logical way of thinking, right? My value equals one and not the other way around. But that way, you cannot assign to the literal and then the compiler would give you an error in C if you were actually accidentally leaving out one of the equal signs. So that's the complicated thought process behind that one, right? Nothing to laugh at here, just maybe a little outdated idea because in C-sharp, we don't ordinarily have this problem. However, you can have the same problem in C-sharp, actually, if you use a bool value, right? If your value is of type bool, in that case, the whole thing can actually be, uh, a, well, you can make the same claim in that case that it might make sense to, to do this the other way around. On the other hand, you can also just test your code. That's another option. I, I guess many of us have heard of that. <laughs> All right, uh, this is another one, right? Similar thing there. So in this case, the programmer actually included uh, the second uh, equals in there and commented it just to make uh, clear that they didn't want it, right? <laughs> at least I think that's the intention because, you know, it's, it's kind of strange. If you look at the thing, you're like, okay, maybe they just wanted to try it this way around for a little while, right? So they commented it with the intention of putting it back later on or something, right? Who knows, really? But this was clearly a, a C++ or a similar programmer as well, as you might notice from the naming of the variable, right? With the M underscore thing, people tended to do that in C++ in particular. So yeah, just uh, l another example of the same kind of problem. Uh, then, of course, people can <laughs> sometimes do crazy things too. 
<laughs> this is not a C sharp example, of course. <laughs> But yeah, this, this is from a real piece of code, I can tell you. <laughs> yeah, that was fun. Um, and then, don't do this, okay? That's just boring. <laughs> you should just do return i equals 3, right? This is just a waste of code up there. Do you know what, what happens here? I find this kind of interesting, practically speaking, because if you show me a piece of code like this, I will read it twice in order to try to understand why on earth you're, you're writing a complex key piece of code like this, right? I'm assuming there has to be something about the logic in there that is more than could just be expressed with one single return statement. So I'll be reading the thing three or four times trying to find what the special thing is that you're doing there, and you're not actually doing any special thing whatsoever, so I'll just be wasting my time, okay? So that's why I don't like this kind of code. Um, People sometimes uh, say, yeah, I'd, I'd want to be able to debug this, right, when I'm returning false. And that's perfectly fine. You can put a breakpoint on the line as it is now, and maybe that's easier. However, you know, that would not mean to me that I'd write my code like this. You know, maybe, if anything, I might go and change it to this temporarily and then change it back before I check it in, right? Because that's uh, maybe as a debugging measure, fair enough, if you don't like conditional breakpoints for some reason, which are also kind of cool, but, uh, you know, do whatever you like. But to change it back before you check it in, right? So that's just a waste of time right there and a waste of uh, code and keyboard. But, uh, you know, maybe you're paid by the line or something. <laughs> I think some programmers are, at least uh, I've heard this from programmers, you know, when you ask them, what have you done today? Have you been productive? And they're like, yeah, I, I wrote uh, 35 lines of code. And, uh, you know, I mean, this doesn't actually sound a lot to me, I have to say, but it's, uh, uh, it's something that I've read somewhere that statistically programmers w w actually write only 35 lines of code in a day. I don't know if that's true or not, but it's a statistical thing that I read at some point. Maybe it's outdated. How many lines do you guys write? Does anybody know this? Nobody here? That's a good thing, right? <laughs> I don't think a programmer's efforts should be judged by counting the lines of code they write. That doesn't really make that much sense. But at the same time, I do believe that if you're being quite productive during a normal day, you should end up writing more than 35 lines of code. Doesn't sound a lot either, does it? So, kind of strange, anyway. Um, yeah. Moving on from that to the uh, not invented here little part here. So that's the idea where uh, people just write code that uh, somebody has already written for them before, right? Or even worse, they write code that they have themselves already written before because they forget or something or they just don't want to reuse whatever they created. Uh, the daily uh, WTF right there, which of course we all know what that really means, but they claim these days that it's uh, worse than failure, right? Um, they, that's a website publishing really crazy stuff, and they have this concept that they intuitively named uh, IHBLRIA. <laughs> Invented here, but let's reinvent it anyway, right? So that's kind of cool. I think a lot of people do this all the time. So, uh, you know, we've got stuff like this, right? That's like uh, doing something that it doesn't really need doing in a way that uh, just defies expectations. So we, we are assigning a variable A to zero, and then if A is not in fact zero, we're going to set it to zero, right? <laughs> or otherwise, <laughs> we're still going to set it to zero. So presumably after the end of this piece of code, A is in fact zero, but what the hell the programmer was thinking when they wrote this, I don't know. Paid by the line, I expect, right? <laughs> there you go. So that's, that's uh, stuff that you don't need to do because other people have already done it for you, right? This is also nice. Constant values are great. We use constant values, I suppose, you know, instead of just having literals all over the place. Sometimes constant values are a great thing. And one of the major points why they are a great thing is, of course, because you can then reuse them, right? So, and, and you can also change them. Like if you have a constant value for an error message, you can change the message later on without having to change or too much code, right? Assuming you use this in various places. So that's great. But how frequently are you going to change the value of the constant called 10? <laughs> is that going to be like 11 tomorrow or something like that? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it is. Uh, this programmer was obviously thinking so. Um, maybe somebody just told him to introduce constants instead of literals all the time, right? So this is me trying to put some positive point on this whole thing, right? 
So I think this is what people do a lot these days, that they tell their programmers, assuming you're like, you know, a team leader or even a teacher of some kind or whatever, they tell people that they have to do something in a particular way every single time because, you know, they are afraid that people might not be doing it like that in, in some important case. However, they neglect the fact that people will just do it blindly without any consideration for the original reasons, right? So, and I can totally see this here, that somebody wrote a coding guideline. We've all got coding guidelines in the companies we work for, right? Aren't coding guidelines great? Shaking your head right there, you don't have a coding guideline? Oh, you wish you had one? <laughs> Very nice. Yeah, well, I do agree, seriously, that coding guidelines are a good thing in a team. However, I can see the coding guideline for this one just uh, plainly stating that they should introduce constant values for all literals, right? That's probably what it says in there. It, maybe it doesn't say quite so much about naming of those constant values, right? Like it might have made a little more sense perhaps to name this constant value by uh, its purpose, right? What am I going to use this value for? And then maybe it would make sense to think that maybe tomorrow it's going to be 11 or something like that. But you don't think about this stuff, do you? And you really should, right? So take this away, I suppose, from a simple example like this here. Always question what somebody tells you, right? I've seen this in so many customer projects where, you know, somebody comes around and I saw this project actually it comes to mind right now where somebody created a WPF application and they had um, a data layer, I think it was based on entity framework or something like that, and that had a bunch of classes, of course. And I looked at the project and I'm like, oh, and we were looking for some place in the project and I was clicking through Solution Explorer and I found a class that was called something and I clicked in it and it, it turned out to be empty and I'm like, oh, I'm in the wrong place or something, why is there an empty class here? And then I looked around and I found another class by the same name and that was also empty. And I go to the guy, hey, you know, why, why you have so many classes hanging around here that are all the same? He's like, yeah, we had this consultant in and he told us we had to do this. Like, he told you you had to do what, right? And he's like, yeah, you know, we had these entity framework classes and these are like our data model. And this consultant said that we need to have another layer there for uh, uh, some sort of application server thing that they were doing, I believe. And we need to have some data transfer type in there and that has to be like the same thing and and the third one was for the view model right so they had actually recreated their entire set of classes for no particular purpose whatsoever just in order to satisfy those requirements of having data transfer types and also view model types right that's how what people do uh, just because somebody tells them to right and this guy came to me and he's like, yeah, you know what, this is really hard work. Whenever we need to change something and put a new property in, I always have to do this in three different places. I'm like, oh yeah, <laughs> go figure, right? So <laughs> what are you going to do? Anyway, so that's, you know, don't do this, all right? It doesn't make any kind of sense. And that's the kind of thing that I derive from looking at a simple line of code like this. Huh? <laughs> Okay, uh, this is a bit small. Actually, it's bigger up there. Very good. Uh, you know, methods that we didn't maybe really need, right? We've got the get current time thing up there, which is kind of cool, I suppose. People do this for the purpose of mocking occasionally, right? So they extract pieces of logic that you would otherwise maybe not think of extracting. However, we also have this here, get null, <laughs> you know? I'm not... You know, I, I can't swear that there is not a single use case in this world where somebody would use a different value for null. Uh, I'm not prepared to swear that, but it's unlikely, I would say, right? Anyway, so yeah, that's very strange. And then we also have this is true implementation down here again, right? That's another really cool one. I decided to have this in here when it comes to reinventing. Uh, because it could have gone in the first part, of course, you know, with the truth values. If value is true, it's true. If value is false, it's false. Otherwise, again, right? Don't you love this? What, what's going to happen if we don't get into any of these branches? Oh dear. <laughs> Return false, right? So yeah. Anyway, but this, this method uh, is seriously is something that I found somewhere. So they, uh, they call this is true. Just a method to check whether something is true. Why would you need this, right? Especially if the input value is a bool. I mean, it could have been <laughs> something else or whatever, but it's a bool. So, uh, I don't know. Uh, you know. If you have any ideas, by the way, as to why somebody might have written something like that, or you're like, oh, I know this, my colleague does this too, 
or I do this too, you know, just speak up, please, right? So I'm constantly looking for explanations on some of those examples. <laughs> a lot of the time, I don't really know why somebody does things like this, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, that's pretty scary, isn't it? <laughs> that is pretty scary. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, what are you going to say about that, right? You're tempted to think for a second that the guy was simply not aware that there is actually a today property in the date-time type, right? And then you go to yourself, oh, wait a moment, right? <laughs> he was obviously aware of this, so what the hell is he getting at? I don't know. Paid by the bite, perhaps. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, we've got other stuff like this. That's pretty cool. This is also, you know, showing some uh, uh, well-founded mistrust in the existing functionality. So <laughs> uh, we, we start out with a decimal here, you know, and then calculate VAT, you know, tax. And then just to make sure that we're actually using a decimal, we're just going to convert the thing again, right? And because we need it, like, uh, I don't know, three times, I think, <laughs> we're just going to do this every time, okay? Do you know, I think, where this problem might have originally come from is that the guy was using 1.2 here, which is inferred in C-sharp as being, a, what is that, a double, actually, I think, right? But not a decimal, right, is my point. They would have had to use a postfix, like the M thing for decimal, which makes a lot of sense, of course, M for decimal. <laughs> Microsoft was obviously thinking money, which is what they... Like, well, I am serious, sadly, but <laughs> they were thinking money because that's what this uh, similar type is called in SQL Server, of course, right? So the money type, but uh, I, I still don't know, I mean, why they thought that uh, M was going to be a good postfix doesn't make too much sense, really, does it? Uh, anyway, so yeah, they could have used that, perhaps, and maybe the developer wouldn't have run into all those issues there, I suppose. Uh, I don't know. I think the function actually works, too, <laughs> uh, assuming that your, uh, that, that your VAT is actually 20%, right? If it's not 20%, you're going to have to rewrite. There. Fair enough. All right. So uh, we've also got cool stuff like this here. This is where reinvention is taking to the next level, right? So this guy obviously had the idea of trying to get the uppercase string for this input string here. So because we all know we should always be using string builders when manipulating strings, right? So he starts by creating a string builder, iterating over all the chars, and then trying to append, uh, you know, the, the char. But before they do this, actually, they convert it back to a string. And, you know, I've actually checked, and I can tell you that the append function does not really throw any exceptions. Right? Just for fun, I looked it up. And, uh, but in case there's an exception, they're just going to append it as it is, right? <laughs> <laughs> Amazing, isn't it? And then they return it. And you know what? This is actually the exact default behavior that the standard to upper function also uses, right? The even, even including uh, the, uh, uh, well, the mechanism to figure out whether a particular character can even be uppercased or not, right? Because there are characters in some languages that can't. And in case that's, that happens, you know, the standard mechanism just includes it as it is, right? So that's the exact same thing right there. Yeah, this just blows my mind. How much time you spend writing something like this and making this all up, uh, just because you're not aware of the standard conversion function, and even then, uh, there is also a char dot to upper, in case you actually need to uppercase an individual char, right? So there's no need to convert it back to a string. So that's, that's just a total waste of time, this kind of thing. And we also got things like this, where people just really think they know the technology, and they're like, hey, this is cool, I'm just going to use this everywhere now. Huh? Link? Link is great, isn't it? So you need the last six digits of a particular, this is a, well, it's a number, but uh, it's a string, in fact. So they uh, check this number string to see if, if whether it's empty and whether it's big enough, and then they reverse the whole string, take six and reverse it again, and then aggregate it. <laughs> cool, eh? This is almost like a functional programmer trying to show that the, the, the technique of functional programming can be applied everywhere, right? Regardless of the simplicity of the problem, <laughs> it is possible to still use link if you really want to. So that, that's, uh, that's amazing to me, these algorithms really, right? 
So before you try to do something like that, I mean, what else can you recommend, really? You should obviously check that that functionality is already there. But it's kind of hard, isn't it? So because what are you going to do? Sometimes when you try to look something up, you know, it's not that easy to find. I mean, it shouldn't be that hard to find maybe to whether you can convert a string to an uppercase string in C sharp using a standard library function, but still. Uh, anyway, yeah, there's, there's just no way around uh, knowing your toolkit, right? Otherwise, somebody's going to come along five years down the line and go, look at the code you wrote there, right? And that happens to me as well. That happens to everybody, doesn't it? So you'll just be like, okay, you know, I wrote this yesterday, and uh, I didn't know it yesterday what I know today. Like Chad said in the keynote, right? He's like, yeah, 10 years ago, I was stupid. And I agree. I, I personally, I think I was stupid 10 minutes ago, right? Because I, I like to learn new things all the time. So if somebody tells me I'm, do I'm doing something wrong, I'll just... Uh, Try to do it better next time, right? Every day is a school day, <laughs> some people say. Uh, right, um, yeah, this one's kind of cool. I don't know if that's large enough. This is unfortunately a little long for the slide. Do you know what? This is for the amazing task of negating an integer, right? <laughs> I don't know how you negate an integer. I go like, you know, minus variable and it's negated. But just check this out. This is really creative, right? And this is not even the complete code because there's also a convert to binary uh, function here involved that is being used. So we convert this to binary and then we iterate over it and we kind of pad it. It only works with 8 bits, by the way. So if your number is greater than 255, you're out of luck anyway, right? <laughs> so that's, yeah, that's kind of sad. And then we iterate over the whole thing again, kind of, and we're converting and then eventually we're adding the, uh, the str a, a 0 or 1 the, to the bits of the string, right? Which, you know, if for a signed integer, that's basically how, this, how the signage works, that there's one bit that defines the sign. And so they're adding this, and then they're converting it back. I mean, these functions here, I didn't copy those. They were like another two screens full of code, I believe, there, right? Reinventing things, very, very popular. And if you think I'm just making jokes about this and showing you stuff like that that you would never do, well, you know, check out your own projects. I bet you're reinventing stuff, right? We all are. We have been reinventing stuff. It's always... Uh, you know, a matter of hindsight, of course, right? You don't want to judge on hindsight. So people, if you look at some piece of code that somebody wrote a few years ago, you will typically find things in there that look from, t from today's perspective as if, as if they had been reinventing something. But then again, maybe at the time they were not, right? Maybe they were just implementing something that was not actually available to them at the time, and then somebody else came along and made it a part of a standard library. That happens all the time, and that's, of course, you can't change that, really. It really shows, in the end, that you've been a, a good programmer and just done your own thing, right? Just always relying entirely on what the standard libraries do for you. That's a, that's a bad thing in its own right. And I've seen this a lot of times, too. You know, I asked my customer, why, uh, why don't you query this, you know, in a slightly different way? He's like, yeah, I tried, but the select won't let me do this. I'm like, yeah, you know what? Maybe you just have to do it yourself, right? You're supposed to be a programmer. You're supposed to be doing things that haven't been done yet, right? You're supposed to create some unique selling value in your application. You must have some feature in there that not everybody else has. Otherwise, who's going to buy it, right? So don't fall in that pitfall, really. But at the same time, of course, don't do everything manually. There are a few other things in here. Uh, converting to minutes, right? We've got milliseconds here, so we're converting to minutes. Let's check first. Negative is false, right? It's very important. If, of course, milli-diff is smaller than zero, we need to make this positive because it's easier, right? <laughs> Importantly, good thing we have the comments. <laughs> Otherwise, who would have known? So <laughs> and then we have to watch out for the exceptional value of zero because, because I have no idea why, right? Because the only thing exceptional about the value of zero is we can't divide by it, right? We all know this, but we're not dividing by it anyway, so who cares? But that's, anyway, we have to watch out for it because it's exceptional. And then uh, make it negative again in the end, right? So, yeah. All right, so milliseconds to minutes, there you go. This is interesting here, uh, a bit of a brain teaser right there. I saw this on uh, Stack Overflow, I think, somewhere. So this uh, is a piece of code. I actually cut uh, like 80%, I think, of the code because the same structure continued hierarchically 
for several browser pages height, right, <laughs> in this particular sample that I was looking at. And uh, it's basically, you know, you can very likely write something like this instead, okay, for each, because that is roughly the pattern uh, that is implemented above. And here's the little brain teaser we have in there. Let's see what kinds of geeks we really are, okay? What's the difference between those two? There is one, I promise. Say again? No dispose? Uh, what do you mean? There is no dispose involved with for each uh, under any circumstances, so I'm not kind of getting the point. No, what's happening there? No, nobody really. There's a difference in the in the logic between those two implementations. Casting, yeah, that's a that's a good start. But what do you mean? There's a cast going on. Yeah, fair enough. But there's also a cast in a way here, right? We we also have to to cast to a type again. Sorry. I'm not sure I understand, but anyway, you know, let me tell you, and those maybe who said something, maybe you were right. The thing is that we're testing whether the type that we have in here is actually the element type that we're looking at, basically, right? So uh, in this case, we're casting these to level 2 item, and then we check whether this has returned a non-null value. And that is something that for each does not do, right? The for each function in, in the face of a, uh, a collection, like maybe, you know, an old style like array list or something, right? There were only objects in there. And the for each function looks at the first element in that case and determines its type. And after that, it assumes that everything will be the same type as the first object. All right. So that is the difference. The manual implementation actually goes and checks for each individual element. And if that is found not to have the right type, it's just going to be skipped. Right? However, in the, in the for each case, if the element is found, if there is an element in the collection that has a, an incompatible type, uh, then we will see an exception coming up. All right? Just a little thing on the side. You guys have this? Whoever tried to reply to me there? Yeah? Very good. Good. That's the thing here. Um, yeah, we've got another thing here that's just as a little hint, you know, this is kind of complicated, but I think in some cases I'm just going to move to a potential solution there. You can benefit from basically just using link, right? This is interesting, I think. You know, this, the, the original code, my uh, back key is not working here, there we go. The original code kind of works all through different hierarchies of functionality here. You know, it, it iterates through the segments of this thing, and then there are data elements nested in there and everything. And the original code uses lots and lots of temporary data, like this array list here and this array list. And this is obviously written by Germans here. And, <laughs> and here's another thing with those components and everything. And, uh, you know, using link, one of the interesting things I think here is, well, first that you save a lot of code but also that you don't have to use any temporary variables at all, right? You can just chain together the individual operations. So I think that's interesting, you know, for on the topic of making use of your tool set, really, using what's there. Uh, this is quite important, really, to realize that uh, you can replace old code like that with simple structures. Now, if you think this doesn't look like a simple structure to you, you should go and practice some link, I suppose, right? <laughs> it's a good recommendation these days, I believe, if you're not there with uh, what you're doing yet. So I'd, I'd totally recommend having a look at this kind of stuff. All right, so I think we'll get a little shorter again here with the code because those long examples are kind of hard to dig through, aren't they? So I'll just quickly look at a few patterns. Um, so patterns are a great thing unless, of course, somebody explains them to you wrongly, right? So this has obviously happened to this programmer here. Somebody came around and said, hey, we're going to need this block of code everywhere that checks for elements, and if they are not null, we need to dispose of them. Apparently they did not tell them to do this before the return, right? That's a nice one there. I encountered this in several hundred functions, actually, because they just pasted it at the end, right? Co copy and paste programming, a really important technique even today. <laughs> and then uh, we have stuff like this here. This is interesting. Do uh, you guys know why you shouldn't do this? I can use any instead, but why? 
It's enumerating the entire collection, exactly. And this is a point where, just to illustrate this, because I see this quite frequently, I'm just going to jump in code here very quickly. We haven't seen a lot of code so far, have we? So uh, let's uh, make this larger. I'm, I'm using Xamarin here, by the way, so that I can stay on my Mac here. And I've got this example in here, right? So I've got this helper that returns a thousand values. And uh, I've got this code that says, if the count, actually, you see I'm missing a little part here. This is what that logic would normally look like, right? If that count is greater than zero here, uh, then we're going to continue doing something, right? And if I execute this, uh, you'll see this down here at the bottom in this uh, application output window. We see that the yield function actually returns those thousand values, which results in a thousand output lines, before we decide that this sequence actually contains something and we need to move on, right? That doesn't make any sense, of course. So instead, I should be using this other function called any, uh, any, if I can quickly type that in there, okay, and um, use this instead. We don't need the greater zero in that case, and execute that again. And now you see that we only return one value there, just to see whether the sequence actually contains anything at all, right? Um, there's also another problem, by the way, with the count thing, which is that, theoretically, a sequence does not really have an end. That's why it's a sequence. It's not a list, right? It doesn't logically have an end. It can iterate forever. So what's count going to do in that case, right? Oh, it's going to hang, actually. And in reality, a lot of the sequences you work with today might be related to some sort of database in the back end, right? So this count thing might be executing SQL statements to your server, trying to do counts of, you know, probably pretty large numbers of records over there just in order to determine whether there's anything at all in that sequence. Not a good thing to be doing, all right? So that's uh, an important one here. Right, let me have a look at the time. We don't have uh, too much time left. There's seven minutes, very good. So um, I've got one more example here, uh, just quickly perhaps, in uh, Xamarin that I can show you. Uh, let me see, this is one of my recent projects, I believe. Um, this is a really cool idea of somebody to break something con in connection with uh, sequences. Hello? Oh, here we go. Uh, let's uh, open this one here. I think I already had this open. Xamarin is not that great at remembering this, apparently. Um, all right, so, uh, you know, I, I, I actually forgot about this, but apparently some guy called Eric Dietrich uh, at one point uh, published this code. Um, and it's a cool idea to break something, I thought. So we're going to create a sequence of points here, right? this here. Uh, this is an iterator down here that, that generates arbitrary points. Whoa, okay, I was just going to mark this up here so you can see that better, right? So this part of code generates uh, points, 20 of them, you know, with the x values just uh, uh, rising uh, with the index and y being calculated, never mind really. Now we have this uh, helper function double x value which uh, gets the sequence passed in and we iterate over the sequence and uh, times two every one of the x values in those points, right? And then we come back out and we fetch the first element by going element at of zero and now the question becomes here, what is the x value in there now? Do, do we have opinions in the room? One? Two? Do I hear more? No? <laughs> uh, the sorry, the point I should show you is my own thing down here. It's a class, right? It's not a structure. Sorry, maybe I skipped that part, if it makes a difference to anybody's considerations here. <laughs> um, okay, so we've got some ones and we got some twos, I think. And uh, I think these are the only logical options, right? So <laughs> unless somebody believes it's zero or three or something like that, no? No, okay. Well, it is actually one. And uh, the reason why it is 1, so I ran this and it says x equals 1 down there. The reason why it's 1 is because we're using a new sequence, right? Basically, we're iterating over the sequence every time this sequence is evaluated. So uh, in this case here, where I'm doing the for each, I will be starting an iteration process over the sequence. And that returns new values, right? Every time the sequence is evaluated, we receive newly constructed value objects there. And then when I run element at, I get a new iteration of a kind uh, running there, even though it just iterates to the first element, but we get newly constructed point objects passed in, right? So that's another very simple way of breaking stuff there. 
Uh, and I thought that was a, a nice little example to show you here as a case where this kind of thing goes wrong, right? Don't do this. Um, I think sequences are a really cool tool these days and people use sequences all over the place all the time. And that's kind of cool. I perfectly like sequences. You know, I'm, I like functional programming myself too, by the way. And in functional programming, we work with sequences all the time. And I think they're really cool. But however, it is important to be aware of the way that your language of choice presumably C-sharp if you're here, evaluates sequences, right? And in C-sharp, uh, that's how it works. There is no, th no such thing as like, you know, lazy evaluation, all that kind of stuff going on there. So that's kind of a, an interesting thing to keep in mind. All right, um, count versus any. Yep, we've seen that one, and we've also seen this iterator uh, example there. All right, which uh, brings me almost to the end here of what I was going to show you today. And we have only a few minutes time, so that's great. The commenting part here uh, is a little more interesting, I think, uh, as a fun element, really. So uh, this is uh, the kind of comment that people like to use if somebody tells them, again, coding guidelines, right? You should always comment what's going on in your application, so that's kind of important. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if the guy with like the 10 constant value also uses this kind of comment, right? Returns 10 most of the time or something like that. We also have comments like this that try to explain why the dog puked on the homework and stuff like that, right? So that's uh, kind of cool too. This isn't the right way to deal with this, but you know, Ron just spilled coffee on my desk. 12 is his lucky number though, right? Very good. So you like programmers like this. That's also great. Just uh, appeal to the gods, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> Please work. Um, and uh, we have stuff like this where people put dates in. I always love this, right? You see these things all the time. So in 2002, they added temporary tracking of the locking sc login screen. And uh, Bob in, in 2007 thinks that's not entirely true. <laughs> yep. And also, <laughs> <laughs> I love comments, you know, comments are the funniest part about programming, aren't they? I, I, I mean, personally, I totally think you should comment, and I comment myself whenever I encounter a situation where I find, you know, if I'm going to look at this code uh, a few days or weeks or years down the line, maybe I won't be able to understand myself quite easily what this code does, or rather maybe what it was intended to do, right? Like the particular constraints that the code was uh, written to observe, right? That kind of thing. So then I write comments. Uh, this kind of stuff, though, is a lot of fun, right? <laughs> I've, I've been tempted to write code like this before myself. I actually have this uh, client uh, who says, you know, they have this really fantastic industrial piece of software and uh, parts of it have been written in assembler by this guy who used to be a mathematician, genius person from, from whatever uh, university. And uh, so th they don't actually understand how this works. And I'm like, yeah, you know what, maybe you're just going to have to recreate that part of the code. And he's like, yeah, but it's part of this really unique solution that our company sells. And we're like the only people in the world who do this. And we have a patent on it, too. <laughs> And you don't know wh how it works? You're like, yeah, we don't know how it works. That's how it is. So they, they've got this old piece of assembler code hanging around that they, they always have to reuse uh, all the time. Magic, do not touch, right? So <laughs> this, of course, is something that happens to a lot of programmers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, this. <laughs> and oh. <laughs> I don't know how that one crept in there, I'm afraid, sorry. <laughs> this is a well-commented line, and uh, this is always important because this has happened to our company. <laughs> and I think I'm done. <laughs> Thanks, guys, for being here. Appreciate it.